So where we stopped yesterday, we had just been talking about the interaction of radiation with matter, and we had started with heavy charged particles like uh, alpha particles and protons, and we had also looked at some other ions as examples like gold. Um, so we're going to switch now and we're going to talk about electrons. Now that we've got a good foundation with understanding how kind of stopping power works and how range works, and we're going to look at char light charged particles like electrons. And electrons are going to basically behave the same way as the heavy charged particles when they move through the materials. The issue is that they are going to have, um, yeah, sorry, Luz, I didn't think they asked you about announcements. Um, glad to hear there's none. They are basically interacting through the same kinds of mechanisms as the heavy charged particles. They see this sea of electrons as they move through the material. So they're still interacting through electrostatic interactions. It, if they're going through air, they, it's, they still lose about 35 electron volts every time they create an ion pair in air. And ions, in fact, lose the same amount of energy, 35 electron volts, every time they create an ion pair in air when they move through it. Um, but we do have to start to consider the fact that the electrons that are coming into the material, the electrons that are, we're considering to be the radiation, have the same mass as the electrons in the stopping material. And so it is possible that those electrons could transfer all of their energy in a single collision. And it's also gonna make those electrons change their paths much more frequently. So you may recall seeing the, the cloud chamber or the um, photographic plate emulsion tracks for those heavy charged ions and how they were extremely straight. Now the electron paths are gonna be much more jagged. They're gonna look more like a random walk kind of thing or um, diffusion and Brownian motion and solutions. And so these electrons can change their paths more frequently and that's gonna affect their physical range, the actual thickness they travel through materials where their ranges are still gonna generally be kind of long, but their tracks are gonna bounce all over the place and that's gonna condense things, just like how your intestines are all wrapped up inside your body even though they're some crazy number of feet long. Um, the electrons, because they're lighter, they're also going to end up having higher speeds than the heavy charged ions. And so they're going to, they're more likely to be relativistic. So their relativistic speeds are going to have a bigger impact on their linear rate of energy loss or their ranges or the stopping power that materials have for them. Um, the statistical treatments that were used to develop the beta block equation, for instance, are less realistic. And this idea of straggling is a bigger deal how some electrons are going to have straighter paths as they move through, just depending on chance, and other electrons are going to bounce around more. So you can have very large variations between single electrons for how far they actually penetrate into matter. And because they're electrons, because they're light particles, they're still charged, this uh, word, this idea or concept of Bremsstrahlung becomes much more important. And so Bremsstrahlung, did you guys discuss that at all in your safety classes? Do you know what that word means? Breaking radiation. Breaking radiation. And so the classic example for this is think about driving in a car and you go to turn around a corner. When you go to turn around that corner, you are accelerating, even if your foot's not on the gas pedal, you are undergoing centripetal acceleration when you make that turn. If you're driving in a car, typically you slow down, right? You lose energy. Well, that's easy to observe in terms of losing that um, mechanical energy. But for an electron, when it loses energy, it typically um, emits light. It doesn't have to, but the electrons will emit light when they undergo or experience this kind of Bremsstrahlung, this breaking radiation effect. And so the electrons, if they come closer to the nucleus, Remember the nuclei of materials is typically pretty positively charged, very high relative to the electron. If you're, even if you're just going through aluminum, your atomic number is 13. So you've got a 13 plus charge in the nucleus interacting with that electron. 
that electron is strongly attracted to it, right? And that acts like a centripetal force. And it bends or turns that electron. That means the electron has to be accelerated. And whenever these charged particles are being accelerated, they tend to emit radiation, they emit light. Um, this amount of Bremsstrahlung or the, uh, uh, the ratio of energy lost through radiation versus electrostatic effects is approximately uh, equal to the atomic number of the stopping material times the energy of the radiation divided by 800. And that's with the energy of the radiation being expressed in MeV. See, so if you have a one MeV, if you have a one MeV, um, Is someone else the host? <laughs> That's interesting. If you have a one MeV electron entering the material, let's just say it's lead, which has an atomic number of 82, and I'm just gonna really round and call it 80, just to make the math, mental math easier. One MeV beta times 80 for the atomic number divided by 800 gives me about 10%. So for an electron, a one MeV electron entering lead, it's gonna lose about 10% of its energy through Bremsstrahlung effects, through radiation interactions, rather than just electrostatic interactions. So Bremsstrahlung is gonna be a, a big factor in how electrons lose their energy. So we need to modify our stopping power equation or our linear rate of energy loss. So the bulk of this equation still looks pretty similar, okay? This is the stopping power or the linear rate of energy loss for an electron as opposed to a heavy charged particle. You do not have to write this down. You're not gonna do any calculations with it. We're just gonna look at the equation and see what it means. In the front coefficient, one thing uh, that you should notice is that it basically looks the same. It is the same factor as the heavy charged ions, okay? The first term here with the natural log is also basically the same. It does have an extra two in the bottom here, and you are um, squaring the ionization energy now, and we didn't do that before, the mean excitation potential. Okay, but otherwise it's basically the same. One of the reasons why I think this is squared and it's multiplied by two is it's kind of related to the fact that the particles you're trying to stop are much closer in mass to the particles that are stopping them, that they're interacting with. And then there's some extra modifications here with the relativistic speeds, the, this beta term, the ratio of the speed relative to the speed of light, a couple of extra terms, Again, related to like thinking through the statistical treatment for the electrons and also trying to account for straggling. The idea that some electrons are gonna pass pretty straight through the material or they have a chance of doing that while other electrons are gonna just bounce around in the beginning once they start to interact within the solid. And then outside of the brackets, the big thing that's really new is the whole term for the Bremsstrahlung radiation, okay? Notice the big thing here is that the Bremsstrahlung radiation depends strongly on the energy of the incident particle. So the higher the energy of the electrons, the higher the energy of the beta particles coming into the material, the more effect there's going to be, the more energy loss there's going to be through the Bremsstrahlung. And we can estimate that with this Z times E over 800, okay? just as a relative ratio between the radiation effects, the Bremsstrahlung, and the electrostatic interactions. So this is a very big equation. It's not really worth trying to do any calculations with by hand. You would typically plug it into some sort of a computational package. But we can get some rules of thumb from this. And people look at water a lot because about 70% of our bodies is water. And so if you wanna understand how radiation interacts within living tissue, 
A lot of times the simplest model for that is just to talk about it passing through and interacting with water. And so we've got two kind of rules of thumb here for electrons in water for what their physical thickness ranges would be, depending on their energies, whether they're less than two and a half MeV or greater than two and a half MeV. So these would be their physical ranges in centimeters that we would expect these um, electrons to be able to penetrate in water. Those ranges you should notice are nearly exponential with energy as energy goes up, okay? The range increases more or less exponentially. We can model the number of electrons remaining. This is the N sub T. This T is not time now, but thickness, physical thickness. We can model the number of electrons remaining using this kind of exponential decay equation. The mu is a term that depends on the energy of the electrons in MeV. That's the 1.7 times the energy raised to the negative 1.14 power. And the T would be the physical thickness or aerial thickness rather in um, kilograms per square meter. Now the nice thing for kilograms per square meter is that it is, the, it is about a thousand times smaller than grams per cubic centimeter. Okay. No question? Yeah. So you were saying the big T in the first two estimations is thickness? The big T, sorry, is energy. Yeah, kinetic energy. Oh, translation, okay, okay. Yeah. And the lowercase t in the exponential equation is the, our aerial thickness. Thank you. Yep. In uh, kilograms per meter squared, where we've been working with grams per square meter a lot lately. Again, we can kind of take our information for the electron ranges and materials, and we really like graphs, and so we can plot graphs for these ranges, and we can use these graphs instead of having to work through and do all of the different equations for stuff. Now, if you have different particles, different electrons of different energies, you might need to come back to this equation to look for what their thicknesses are um, if you're looking for when certain amounts are left over, and that'll be an example we'll do in a minute. But if you know the energy of the electron, this is plotted on the y-axis. I think this was just to make this figure um, shaped better in a uh, textbook, but it might also have been how they were determined. So you would use a different thickness of absorber that would give you your range, and you could look at the energy remaining or the energy lost by the electrons as they pass through that thickness of material. So again, just as an example on here, let's say you have a one MeV electron, you would find that on the y-axis, look across, it's just a little bit above a range in aluminum of 400 milligrams per square centimeter, okay? So, Let's apply a few of these equations. So 10 MeV electrons, what would the range of 10 MeV electrons be in aluminum? Don't all shout it out at once. Go ahead and look on the graph for this and type your answer into the chat to me privately so that I know when you have determined the range of 10 MeV electrons in aluminum. In a lot of 5500s, saw a couple of 5000s. Again, since we're reading a graph, there will be some allowed tolerances here. Um, and it is a little bit tricky with the log plots to try and figure out what some of the tick marks are. 
but I would say that that's probably about 5,500, 5,400 maybe milligrams per square centimeter. All right, what thickness of aluminum is needed to reduce to 50% the number of beta particles coming from pure sources of? So the trick with these is gonna be that these different sources are going to have My mute keeps going on and off. That's why I keep like pausing. I'm not sure. What's Lewis going. is probably on the other side saying, this is so funny and just. <laughs> <laughs> Let's mess with him, right? Um, so the tritium, the carbon 14, the phosphorus 32, these are each going to have different beta endpoint energies. And it's that endpoint energy that you want to use when you solve for this mu. Okay. So. This mu, 1.7 times E, and this E is the energy to the negative 1.14. And we have tritium, carbon-14, and phosphorus-32. So looking at your chart of the nuclides, yay, you can find these beta endpoint energies on the chart. So if it's radioactive and you're lucky, because it's not always on here, but I chose nuclides where it was, if it's radioactive, they don't often give you the um they don't always give you the energy but they do often give you the beta endpoint energy so maybe you recall that in beta decay because it's a three po three body problem and you get neutrinos out all of the uh, electrons all of the beta particles are not going to have a single discrete energy there's a range of energies they could have but the energy that's going to be given in the chart of the nuclides is going to be the endpoint energy. So this beta, they give it in MeV, and that's the units we want to use for this equation. This is 0 0.018591 MeV. So for our mu, we just want to raise that to the exponent and multiply by our 1.7. to find our mu. And I thought I had that already worked out by hand, but did anybody already plug that in and can save me some time? 159.8. Yeah. Did it again? 159.8. And this would be in the units for this would be meters squared per kilogram. So our thickness, our T, when we express that, the range here, we want to go ahead and take our NT over N naught equals E to the negative mu T. This starts to look familiar, right? If we want this to be 
then this becomes one half. To be able to solve for t, we're now taking the natural log of one half equals negative mu t. So our natural log of 0.5 one half divided by our mu gives us our aerial thickness. Uh, where did the minus sign go? Uh, good point. When you divide by the mu, the natural log of one half is actually going to be negative 0.693, right? So this natural log, that negative cancels out with it. So I'm just going to move it over here. Make that negative natural log of 0.5, okay? Got it, thank you. Yeah. So this T is a pretty small number, 0 0.00434. Chris, you're muted. Oh, not anymore. It keeps happening. I have a question. Where I'm not touching anything. Yeah. Could this perhaps be called this, or is could this perhaps be the absorption half thickness? Yes, or half value layer is sometimes also what it's called. Okay. There might be All right. yeah, you could do, apply different terms for this. Because in our lab, we have something like this, and I was real confused on it. That's what it is. So um, I've usually heard half value layer or half value thickness, and it's, you're exactly right. It's the thickness of material necessary to reduce the number of particles by 50%. Um, the kilograms per square centimeter per square meter, um, if you wanted to change this to grams per square centimeter, you would multiply by a thousand grams per kilogram. And you would multiply by 100 centimeter, no, other way around. One meter over 100 centimeters but you square the whole thing. So you end up getting a really small number, which would be expected because these electrons are very low energy. So from tritium, this is a lot of times why some people say tritium is not a big concern because outside of your body, there's no issues with it. The radiation is so low energy that it's also basically stopped by your skin, just like alpha particles. So why do you think tritium might still be an issue, even though outside of the body, the beta particles from it could be stopped by our skin? Could be ingested you drink, water. You yeah, could you drink tritium water. So hydrogen's an element contained in water, and if you're drinking water that contains tritium, where that tritium has been incorporated into the water, then it's inside your body, and just like alpha particles inside your body, now it's more likely to be able to cause some damage. So carbon-14, I'll ask you to calculate that one. And its beta endpoint energy is 0 0.157 or 157 keV. So what should happen to its range or its half value layer? Should it stay the same, be greater or less than the half value layer for the tritium? Be larger. Should be larger. So higher energy, it's gonna travel further. It's gonna take more material, one to stop it, but also to cut the number of particles in half. Do 
Did you say that was KEV and not MEV? I was just giving you the comparison. So it's 157 KEV, but in the equation, we do want to use it as MEV to find the mu. And the tritium particles were about 18.6 KeV. So the carbon-14 beta particles are still considered to be low energy beta particles. And I found my nice note finally, where I had already worked some of these out ahead of time. And where I had gone ahead and used the density of aluminum to convert these to linear thicknesses. So the tritium range, the half value layer for that tritium would actually have been 1.6 micrometers. Again, just emphasizing how small that range is, how small of a thickness you need to cut them in half. You're Carbon. dividing you're dividing mu by the density to get um, the micrometers. Dividing the t. So I solved for the t. Oh, the t. Okay. In the given units, and then I went ahead and converted the t to find it in meters, and then just kind of solved what the exponents were and changed it to micrometers. So these are the half value layers. What would you expect the um, thicknesses to be to cut the number of remaining particles down to 10%? How, would you, how should those thicknesses compare to these thicknesses? I feel like it'd be exponentially higher. Yeah, much higher. Any questions on this part? especially with the half value layers, like you said, I think it came up in your lab. Is that due today or did you already have to turn it in? Friday, I think. Friday. Yeah, it's due Friday now. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks to the one and only Hunter. <laughs> it's a collaborative effort. All right, so um, let's move along. I have a quick question on yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you convert it from kilogram per meter squared to grams per centimeter squared, the density is going to, to get it into like a, an actual thickness, is that what you did in the bottom there where it's like? Yeah, and that was just expressed in the correct units. So it's also 2,700 gram, uh, milligrams per cubic centimeter. Okay, so you'd have to convert. So like I I did it, I've got my aerial thickness in grams per centimeter squared, so I'd need to use 2.7. Yeah, mm-hmm. Met always to match the units so they cancel out the right way. All right, so we had the foundation laid from the alpha particles and the protons. The electrons pretty much behave the same way, but through electrostatic interactions, but they have this extra interaction, um, the breaking radiation, the bremsstrahlung, which causes them to lose uh, energy through radiation. So, and that's an issue 
when you have high energy electrons or when you have high Z stopping materials, okay? So with these examples here with the aluminum, the Bremsstrahlen would not have been as large of a concern, okay? Um, with the phosphorus 32 compared to the tritium, Bremsstrahlen with the phosphorus 32 would be more significant than with the tritium because it's higher energy, the beta particles could be, okay? Again, with the continuum of energies for beta decay, not all beta particles are always gonna be high energy, but because the phosphorus 32 does emit high energy beta particles, Bremsstrahlen would be more of an issue, okay? With, am I sharing the right thing? No. So here I am looking at the examples. So moving along, so that kind of covers our charged particles. Now we want to talk some about neutral particles. And our neutral particles, our gammas, are going to be the main thing we're going to talk about. And then we'll kind of wrap up with neutrons a little bit. So coming back and kind of putting yourself in the shoes of these particles, now imagine that you're a gamma particle. You're just kind of shooting through space, right? You're a ray of light. What are you going to see when you enter that matter? Are you going to be affected by the charge of the electrons or the charge of the nucleus at all? So you don't care about that charge. You're just going to keep on steaming through until what do you think could happen? You're that gamma particle, you're charging through matter and you hit something. Hit something. So you're actually going to have to physically collide with the nucleus or electrons? Which one do you think is most likely? Electrons. Electrons, okay. So partly because of the energy equivalency between the electrons and the gamma particles, but also because of the number of electrons, they're more likely to be collided with the gammas. Um, there are exponential interactions um, like electrons, but through different mechanisms. Oh, yeah, so the number of gamma particles remaining, number of gamma rays remaining after passing through material goes down in an exponential decay kind of fashion, just like the electrons do. But whereas the electrons were losing energy through electrostatic interactions and Bremsstrahlung, the gamma particles lose energy through different mechanisms, okay? And this was where, um, thanks Ira, I think you were the one who asked the question before. This is kind of where the half value layer term came up or the 10% value layers. And in this equation, they changed the terms around a little bit. The X now is the thickness of the material and the mu depends both on the incident energy and the absorbing material. And so you would typically have to look that mu up or look for it on some sort of a graph, okay? So you're this gamma particle, you're coming into matter, you are gonna collide with an electron. What are the two things that could happen when you collide with that electron? Give me two possible outcomes. You could release a different energy gamma ray. You could collide with that electron, but only transfer part of your energy, yeah? So the incident gamma particle retains some of its energy and some of it goes to the electron. And so that gamma is gonna scatter. It's gonna hit that electron and scatter in a different direction at some other angle, okay? What's the other thing that could happen besides depositing some of its energy? Give it all. Yeah. Give it all away. If the photon, if the gamma collides with an electron and transfers all of its energy to that electron, what's that called? And somebody brought this term up yesterday, but. Absorption? The photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect, okay. Yeah, 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 Einstein. Yeah, okay, great. So the photoelectric effect is the primary mechanism for energy loss from gamma rays 
when the gamma ray energy is low. And if it depends on the energy and the energy has to be low, then this is also the primary mechanism for energy loss by X-rays. X-rays, remember, tip, uh, defined as coming from decay of electron states in the shells where those electrons are falling into lower energy shells and they emit an X-ray, whereas gamma rays are coming from nuclear transitions. So we have atomic electron transitions giving us X-rays. We have nuclear transitions giving us gamma rays. They technically overlap in terms of energy. You can have X-rays that are higher energy than some gammas. You can have gamma rays that are lower energy than some X-rays, okay? And of course, Einstein, this was the thing he won the Nobel Prize for, explaining the photoelectric effect, more so with visible light, but we still see the same mechanism with gamma rays and X-rays. And you already mentioned the scattering. So the gamma ray can come in, it can collide with an electron and not give all of its energy away, and that gamma ray scatters at another angle in some other direction. This is the most um, likely mechanism or the most important mechanism for energy loss for medium energy gamma rays. It's nearly independent of the Z of the absorbing material. It is inversely proportional to energy, but it is proportional to the electron density per gram. So the number of electrons per gram. And the third mechanism through which gamma rays can interact is called pair production. This is when a gamma ray comes in to the material, it passes close to a nucleus, and there's some sort of an interaction that it has with the strong nuclear force. And it actually creates, the gamma ray disappears and creates a beta and a, a beta minus and an, a positron. This is the most probable mechanism for energy loss from gamma rays when those gamma rays are greater than 5 MeV of energy. And you have to have a minimum of 1.022 MeV of energy in the gamma ray for pair production to even occur. So if you're less than 1 MeV of energy, you're not even going to think about pair production happening from those gammas. Okay. Is that um, 1.022 MeV? I think we've talked about that a little bit with um, Cody when we were talking about like Q values. Is that that same where that comes from? The Q value has to be positive. That was the Q minimum Q value for positron decay, correct? Right. And that's why that number comes up because it's related to that creation of both a positron and an electron. When the positron from positron decay slows down and meets another electron somewhere, and the two matter and antimatter annihilate, then that's when you get that all of that energy back out, but you get it back out in the form of two gamma rays. Did you guys go further into annihilation last week or no? No, okay. So the figure on the right side of the slide here is representing our. Um, half thickness values for photon energies in different materials, okay? So in general, notice that the higher the energy, the higher the half thickness. But you should see on this figure as well, you should see some zigzags. What do you think is causing those zigzags for different materials? Why, when your photon energy in Lead, yeah, lead is kind of cool there. Lead has a bunch of zigzags. Why when your photon energy is about 13 keV, is there a very high half thickness? Why does, it, why does that photon travel so far through the material? But then when you bump the energy up by a little bit and bump it up to about 14 keV, why does that half thickness drop all of a sudden? Now the photons aren't traveling as far. That means they're more likely to interact. Why do you think, say, 14 keV electrons are more likely to interact in lead than 13 keV electrons? Any idea? Does it pass a threshold for the photoelectric effect? It passes a threshold for the photoelectric effect. And so those zigzags 
are associated with the binding energies of the electrons. The kinetic energy of the ejected electron equals the energy of the gamma ray that collides with it or the photon that collides with it minus the binding energy of the electron. So again, the photoelectric effect is a complete transfer of energy to the electron. The probability for this occurring is proportional to the atomic number of the stopping material, Z, to the fourth, divided by the energy of the gamma ray to the third. So the higher the Z of the material, the more likely the photoelectric effect is to occur. The higher the energy of the gamma ray, the less likely the photoelectric is to occur, a photoelectric effect is to occur, okay? If you were interested in seeing this with, with a whole bunch of different values, Lawrence Berkeley Lab has a whole X-ray database that's accessible. You can look up what all the different binding energies are for all the different electron shells and everything. But let's just go ahead and take this, this vanadium as an example. Um, what energies of electrons could you eject from vanadium if a 5 keV gamma ray interacts through the photoelectric effect. And I should tell you that energies, the binding energies in that um, table are in electron volts. So our 5 keV, think of that as being 5,000 eV. So what could be the energies of electrons that you could eject from the photoelectric effect? 5,000 minus, Is it 1,022? 5,000 minus? 000. I think it's all of them but the K-shell. All of them but the K-shell. And so you would see a range of ejected electron energies, and the energy remaining would just be 5,000 minus 37.2, or 5,000 minus 626.7. So then what's going to happen to the half value layer for a 5.4 keV gamma compared to a 5.5 keV gamma in vanadium? You'd see an extra band, right? You, would, you could see an extra electron ejected. So what's going to happen to that half value layer, that half value thickness? Are you going to need more material to stop the 5.5 keV gamma or less? Is it going to be more likely to interact within the material, the vanadium, or less likely? Be less, right? Less more. what? Because it's more likely to interact, right? More so likely to interact, so less thickness for the yeah. stopping material. Exactly, okay? So this plays a role when we look at different materials for stopping gamma rays. And it does mean you want to be careful, especially if you're trying to shield look for low energy gamma rays, and you don't want to pick the wrong material and the wrong thickness where you're letting way more gammas through than you thought you were. Can you, re can you explain that concept of if there's more energy of a gamma ray, you would need less material to stop it? Is that what's being said? If the, in general, the higher the energy of the gamma ray, the less likely it is to interact through the photoelectric effect in general. So this is like thinking periodic trends on the periodic table where atomic radius decreases as you go left to right, yeah? Or ionization energy increases as you go left to right. But like thinking first ionization energy, there's little exceptions to that, like where the shells are half filled or perfectly filled. Yeah, orbitals are filled or half filled. And so the photoelectric effect with the shells plays a role here on this graph. So in general, as you, we see the photon energy increasing, we see the half thickness increasing. It's gonna take more material to stop higher energy gamma rays in general, okay? But depending on the material, we see these big drops in our half value thickness, our half thicknesses, 
at specific energies that are related to the binding energies of the electrons. And those like kind of drops come from the idea that we just talked about where um like comparing the 5.4 versus the 5.5 gamma ray. Exactly. Okay. So between say 1 keV or 650 eV and 5,465 eV, as the energy increases, the range increases. But then as soon as you get over that 5,465 eV, now you have an additional interaction that's possible that's gonna increase the probability of interaction, which is gonna decrease the range of the gamma ray. So it's like our first ionization energy that's generally increasing as we go across the periodic table, left to right. But then all of a sudden, when we get to like a half-filled shell at nitrogen, nitrogen has a high first ionization energy. Oxygen actually has a lower first ionization energy than the nitrogen, okay? So it's that kind of behavior, that kind of pattern, where the half thickness is increasing as the energy of the gamma ray increases, but at specific energies depending on the stopping material. So that's why you want to know the stopping material and the energy of the gamma ray. At specific energies, we see these big changes in how likely things are to occur. Okay, so is that good? We talked around it a little bit maybe, but. Um, so photoelectric effect, the big thing to keep in mind is the probability. Higher Z, lower energy, more probable photoelectric effect, okay? Compton scattering was originally stated in terms of wavelengths. So the wavelength of the scattered photon minus the wavelength of the original photon was equal or was proportional in some way to the scattering angle. So if your angle there is zero, that represents no scattering, then there's no difference in the wavelengths, okay? If your angle is one degree, then your cosine is as close to one as it can be just about without being one. That's extremely small because that gamma ray is basically not scattered at all or just scattered a small amount, its wavelength shift would be very small, okay? Now, rather than working with wavelengths, what we typically do is we look at energies, okay? Um, and if you, but if you do look at the wavelengths, what would you say for maximally scattered photons. If a photon was scattered the most it could be scattered, what would its scattering angle be? It would be 180. 180. What would the cosine of 180 be? Negative one. Negative one. What's one minus negative one? Two. Two. So your difference, your wavelength shift for a maximally scattered photon would always be two over MC. And the MC here, the M is for the mass of an electron because that's what the gamma ray is colliding with. So we could use our 5, 11 keV, right? times C, 2H, two times Planck's constant. That means no matter what the energy is of the gamma ray, it would always have the same wavelength shift for a maximum scattering. Of course, when we go to energies, we're not always gonna see the same energy difference. We currently think of Compton scattering, or we use it, the equation more often, as the equation here for E gamma prime. So the energy of the scattered photon, the energy of the scattered gamma ray is equal to the original energy of the gamma ray divided by everything there in the denominator. One plus the ener original energy of the gamma ray over mc squared. That could be our 511 now. Yeah, the m earlier should have been um, kilograms for the electron, not the 511. The mc squared there can be our 511 keV. 
especially if we're expressing the gamma ray energies in KeV, the one minus cosine theta, the theta is the scattering angle, okay? Compton scattering um, is the most important mechanism in tissue. Why do you think Compton scattering is more likely in, say, water or living tissue than the photoelectric effect? Because our human bodies and water aren't metal, mostly. Yeah, water, even if you go with the oxygen or even if you add up the two protons with the oxygen, the Z for that material is very low. So photoelectric effect is not as likely to occur in the human body or in living tissue as Compton scattering. So the table on the right shows you some examples of original gamma ray energies, scattered gamma ray energies, okay? The amount of energy transferred and the percentage of energy transferred. And so a 50 keV gamma coming in and being scattered at 180 degrees is only gonna lose about 17% of its energy in that scattering event. When the energy of the gamma ray goes up, 150 keV, it's gonna lose about 37% of its energy in one single scattering event. 500 keV gamma loses two thirds of its energy. A 3000 keV gamma loses almost all of its energy. That would be a three MeV gamma, okay? That's kind of high. So the percentage of energy lost is gonna depend on the incident gamma ray but we can look at the energy transferred and the energy transferred is gonna come up when we talk about detectors, okay? So just keep that in mind that Compton scattering is gonna be kind of big when we're trying to interpret spectra when we're talking about detectors. Any questions with Compton scattering? So if that energy transfer is like enough can it still like knock an electron off of a water molecule oh yeah mm -hmm. so these and these gamma rays remember are high enough energy um, that when you think about where ionizing radiation is pretty much everything from ultraviolet up in terms of energy has enough energy to ionize matter okay um, and definitely the energy transferred there, that's energy transferred to the electron. That would be 8.4 keV or 8,400 electron volts. You would want to go back maybe and look at the material that it was scattering in. And you could figure out the energy of the electron by subtracting the binding energy. Even though it's not the photoelectric effect anymore, it's still the scattered electron for you to scatter that electron for that gamma ray to scatter and when it gives energy up to that electron and the electron gets ionized away from the atom, it does have to overcome that binding energy still, okay? What, what exactly does maximally scattered mean? I that is, it comes in and it bounces back the same way it came in. So it's- Oh, okay, okay. Scattered angle is 180 degrees, okay? Now you could solve this for other scattering angles as well. Those are some exercise questions, for instance, okay? But for coming in and bouncing right back out, this is gonna be an important concept when we look at detectors. Are all scattering angles equally likely? Um, That is a great question. I'll have to think about that and get back to you. I want to say no, just because I know how spectra look, even though I'm not ready to show you that yet with the detectors. Um, but I will double check on that, make sure that's right. I'll write that down. All scattering angles 
With um, pair production, the final mechanism through which gamma rays interact, as we said earlier, the gamma ray comes in close to a nucleus, interacts within the strong nuclear field, field, strong nuclear field of the nucleus, produces an electron and a positron. These fly apart from each other to conserve momentum at almost, but not exactly 180 degrees, okay? So the gamma ray, when it comes in, it has some forward momentum, which is why the scattering angle for or the positron and electron emission do not happen exactly at 180 degrees from each other. To form this, for this to happen, again, there's a minimum of 1.022 MeV in the gamma ray. The full energy of that gamma ray gets split between the two particles, minus the 1.022, once the particles are formed. Pair production is most likely within high Z materials because you have a very high uh, nuclear charge. So you have a very high um, nuclear field as well, strong nuclear force field from the nucleus. And that's the range over which these interactions have to occur. And again, pair production is the most probable mechanism for gamma rays over 5 MeV. So thinking back to our electrons, how will the electrons interact within the material once they're formed? So the gamma ray comes in, produces a pair, a positron electron pair. The electron flies off in some direction. How is that going to interact within the material? Could it ion or transfer all its energy to another electron and ionize? or a series of electrons. And so it's gonna interact the same way that a beta particle would have that came in from the outside. Eventually that electron is probably going to end up depositing all of its energy within that material. How will a positron interact? Is that gonna be different from the electron in any way? It'll annihilate an electron, won't it? It'll annihilate right in the very beginning or Um, well, now what I think it's going to do when it, it so the positron comes out from this pair production. It's moving very fast. It has a lot of energy. What is it going to do as it moves through the material, just in general? Like deposit energy until it like reaches like a minimum, and then it can just annihilate with some electron. Yeah, electron. exactly. So basically, it interacts the exact same way as the electron does. It's just that it's got a positive charge until it slows down enough where it can undergo annihilation. Because that positron is not stopped, but does still have some forward momentum, when that positron meets another electron, and the other electron may even have some momentum of its own, the overall net momentum is gonna cause the annihilation gamma rays to come out again, at close to, but not exactly 180 degrees from each other. So what exactly is the, the initial gamma ray inter, so when it creates a pair, is it interacting with anything or is it just kind of popping these two particles into existence? It, it's interacting, so the gamma ray is somehow interacting with the nuclear field nuclear force field from the nucleus. So there's the strong nuclear force that holds everything together, and there's the weak nuclear force that kind of moderates beta decay. So um, I don't know enough actually about pair production to tell you exactly how it happens or why the theory behind it for it occurring. It just, the gamma ray has to come close to the nucleus and it has to be extremely close to the nucleus for this pair production to occur, okay? Now the figure here on this slide, unfortunately, it was a great image, but they're showing you what happens to a positron that comes out of a nucleus, as opposed to a positron that comes from pair production. But that walk, that random walk, that pathway that it takes from the nucleus to the annihilation event is analogous to the pathway it would take from a pair production event. 
And so are there two directions of the gamma ray because one is the incident and one is the after effect? So these gamma rays here are the annihilation gamma rays, not the original gamma ray that caused the pair production. If that's what you were getting at. Whereas I didn't show a good picture. I didn't really show, a, I don't have a picture of the pair production happening. These are just the annihilation electrons. This is where the uncertainty comes in now with doing positron emission tomography. So if you have a nucleus somehow that you can tag to a molecule and you can get that to go somewhere in the brain or the body, living tissues, and it decays and it emits a positron, the idea that you can track those annihilation photons back to where the annihilation occurred is great, but there's always going to be some gap, some distance between where the annihilation occurred and where the positron decay occurred. So if you're trying to say, well, this is where that positron decay occurred, and this is where that molecule was in the, in the brain, and those are the receptors I was targeting with my positron emission tomography or PET, PET study, there's always going to be some uncertainty there associated with this slowing down of the positron. So this is kind of a, a physical barrier that we're not going to be able to break um, in nuclear medicine. And I think you're having a whole week on nuclear medicine and positron emission tomography and all kinds of stuff like that. But come back to this and think about that when you're learning about those PET scans and how they've been able to improve the resolution of those images. I only have a couple more slides I'd like to get through before we break, because um, then this will wrap up interaction of radiation with matter. So probably maybe five more minutes. So here's a picture for lead. On our left axis, this is our mass attenuation coefficient. This is the mu. And the top line is going to represent the total attenuation coefficient for different energy gamma rays in lead. Some of those lines represent things like the photoelectric effect, especially below, say, around um, 2, 0.2 MeV or 200 keV. Basically, the mu, the mass attenuation coefficient, is dominated by the photoelectric effect. Okay. Um, there are other things that can happen, like Raleigh scattering. We didn't really talk about that. That's kind of low in terms of probability, and it goes down as energy goes up as well. We have the Compton scattering. There's also something called Compton absorbance, and we also have the pair production, okay? And overall, we would combine all of these interactions to figure out what our overall mass attenuation coefficient was. But you should notice from this plot that the photoelectric effect, again, is most likely up until eh, around 600 keV or so in lead. And this is going to heavily depend on the absorbing material. Compton scattering dominates pretty much between uh, 800 keV maybe and about three and a half MeV. And in lead, pair production is the most dominant mechanism above three and a half MeV for this gamma ray, okay? And again, you can see the zigzag, zigzags there on the left side from the photoelectric effect and the binding energy of the core electrons. So you have these L edges and this K edge, and that's something people talk about if they're doing stuff with like x-rays or whatever. Can you explain one more time how you know what's more likely in terms of like what line is gives the higher uh, coefficient for an energy? From this graph? Right. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the dashed lines that you can see kind of down near the bottom, those are all labeled. So if you look at the dashed line that starts on the x-axis just above 1 MeV, and it kind of arcs all the way up 
and ends on the left side at about 100 MeV because that's where the figure stops. That curved line is labeled as pair with what looks like a kappa in a row, but that's for pair production. That dashed line. And where that dashed line is above all of the other dashed lines, that's going to be where that's the most likely mechanism. And that dashed line for pair production becomes the highest probability, becomes the highest contributing factor to the mass attenuation somewhere around three and a half MeV, where it crosses over with Compton scattering. Okay. We didn't talk a whole lot about neutrons. So here's a slide for neutrons. Remember these were heavy particles, but they're neutral. Because they're neutral, they're not gonna have electrostatic interactions, so they're kind of like gamma rays. Because they're so large compared to electrons, collisions with electrons that affect the neutrons are unlikely. Even though, even though there's a lot of electrons, interacting with them is not very likely. And even if they did collide, they're not gonna transfer a lot of energy. So for us to stop neutrons in material, if you're thinking about shielding or if you're trying to detect them, we really have to rely on them colliding with other nuclei. You can look at the energy remaining with the neutron compared to its original energy by comparing the mass number of the absorbing material, that's the A, with all those other terms, including the scattering angle for the neutron. So just in general, which nuclides do you think would be best for energy transfer? What mass numbers do you want to have? Z's that absorb? are very low. Very low. Z's, A's, yeah. So ideally, what would you want to use? Helium. Or, wait. What's the lowest Z you can think of? Oh, hydrogen. <laughs> hydrogen, yeah. You were thinking on the right way. So hydrogen is going to be the best. So what kinds of materials have a lot of hydrogen in them? Because, of course, hydrogen gas isn't going to be so great. So what could you do to, Hunter? I said hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons. And what form do hydrocarbons take when they're solids? What do you call those? Polymers. Polymers would be good. I never even thought of saying polymers. I want to say lipids, but lipids. that's my all. And solid lipids are known as? Fats. Say it again. Fats. No, I think that's, that's the same word. Fats, or I'm thinking wax. So like oh, paraffin okay. wax used to be used as a shielding material for neutrons, okay? Um, polymers are great. Plastics would be great for absorbing neutrons as long as they were high, um, high, 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 high heart hydrogen containing polymers. Um, you wouldn't want a lot of double bonds or stuff like that. What about other kinds of reactions? Surely neutrons can interact in other ways, right? Do you know any other ways neutrons can interact with matter? Uh, fission. Fission. You can also have neutrons actually physically scatter off of the nucleus and it leaves some energy behind by exciting the nucleus. So you can excite nuclei into like isomeric states. You could have N gamma reactions where the neutron is absorbed by the nucleus and then the nucleus emits a gamma ray to get rid of some extra energy. For very high energy neutrons, you can actually um, have them collide with the nucleus where it is kind of like a fission reaction, but not really, because what happens is that neutron comes in and gives so much energy to the nucleus that it knocks out a bunch of stuff off the back. So these are sometimes called knockout reactions or spallations. Are one of these um, interactions the thing that Dr. Cody was talking about where like we're, we're bombarded by like a lot of neutrons, but it doesn't really matter? So that's probably mostly, say, the inelastic scattering. And it really depends on the energy of the neutron coming in. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Why is it that low 
uh, low mass number nuclides are best for energy transfer? Uh, because they're closest to the mass of the neutron. So thinking back to like general physics or thinking back to the our charged particle thing, remember that when you've got two um, objects and they collide, if they're equal mass, then it's possible that they can completely transfer all of their energy, right? Got it. Like the Newton's cradle kind of thing. So um, if that neutron is neutral and collides with a hydrogen nucleus and causes that hydrogen nucleus to move. Well, now that hydrogen nucleus is charged and it's gonna have more mechanisms, more opportunities for it to deposit its energy in the material. And so if you can get that neutron to kick out an ion, the ion is gonna lose energy faster in the material than the neutron would, okay? So final slide here, I'm just gonna make sure you know it's there. This is your exercise to think about from some of today's stuff so far. And let's take a break. Uh, let's come back around 12.25 and we will pick up and start on detectors. And I did see your note, Jeff. Thanks for looking that up for me. Um, and I will bring that up when we restart. Yeah, you're welcome. No, I, w I was blanking on it at first too. And I was thinking of Compton Continua being perfectly flat, but that's not always the case. It depends on your detector and so on. It depends on the energy of the photon, so. See, and what I was picturing, I guess, was I was picturing that the Compton edge kind of goes up well, let me draw it this way. The Compton edge kind of co goes up and then it typically comes down. So it's pretty flat, but there is kind of more of a bump there at the Compton edge. Right. So right. I wanted to say that 180 was the most probable, but that, that they were all pretty close in terms of probabilities. Yeah. That so, kind of makes sense though, the low energy being the most likely for scattering when you just think about like collisions and larger angle scattering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you pick up on anything else that makes me sound old? <laughs> no, I've been trying my best. <laughs> I got nothing. You're doing too good of a job. Yeah, I've got this, um, the summer school had a few copies a few years back of this Fari Mensing textbook, mm. which is so cool. Like sometimes now I think if I wasn't a chemist, I might've been like a geologist or a geochemist. Um, and this is where I got a bunch of the stuff for the radio dating from. So, okay. And I think some in some of their examples, or maybe when they were explaining the the Libby values and the conventions, I think that was where the old half life came from for carbon fourteen. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I read I read journal articles about um, radio dating, you know, various methods, and they generally confuse the heck out of me because they use these weird ratios. Yeah, and so it wasn't until I. I listen to your lecture, I thought, oh yeah, well that's where that, all that's coming from. I dug into it too, and I was kind of wondering, you know, why didn't they ever update it? But I guess, I guess if everybody always uses the same values, as long mm -hmm. as you know those are the values being used, then you know how to convert stuff into real ages. Yeah. But, and you don't have to worry about, oh well this article is from 1999, yeah. but this one was from 2000 and they changed the standard in 2000, so. My wife also likes that painting behind you. Yeah, it's been a favorite for people who are coming in. So <laughs> at first, a lot of people were laughing, saying it looked like a hat, like a Napoleon yeah. hat or something like that. But that's what she said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looks great. You're well, well centered. Michael, you got a question? Yeah, I'm just ha I'm having trouble with like the, the equations, the beta block equation, and the other yeah. one, and getting the two to agree. Oh, um, the, the two equations, 
you may not get exactly the same answer. Is that what you're getting at? I'm Did getting like, close? I'm getting similar answers, but they're differing by magnitude. Oh, yeah. Um, Which, but, and what I did is I have, um, I made an Excel spreadsheet to make like the calculations easier. So I have it all formatted where you just put in the different parts. And so I can't get them, I can't get the two numbers to agree. And so I went through, cause I know um, I have the one example from class, which I used for that first equation. And then with the homework, I used that to set up the second one, but then the answers that I'm getting, one of them differs by a factor, by like one order of magnitude, and the other one differs by two orders of magnitude. So I'm not sure what the... So you worked through both of the ones from the class, and did you get the same answers that I had, or did you have different... Uh, yeah, I guess that's what I, I wanted to look at, the um, the beta block from the example from class. So, and I didn't write out the whole thing for that, unfortunately. I have a couple of what, a few of what the values should have been, like the delta E max. When yeah, so I'm getting a delta E max of 621.5. Let me double check that. What are you plugging in for your delta E max calculation? Um, let's see, I'm using four times the mass of an electron multiplied by the A. So what of the mass are you using for your electron? Oh, 0 0.0005458 AMU. Okay. Um, multiplied by the A of the target and the kinetic energy and MEV. And what are you using for the M of the target? Well, uh, no, wait, wait. That's not the M for the maximum energy transfer. Um, yeah. That's not the M of the target, that's the M of the projectile. Okay. So in our case here with all of the alpha stuff, you could use the um, you could use the four AMU. I rounded that a little bit. If you're using the electron mass in AMU, or your electron mass is how else did you express that? Because in the so in the homework problem that is uploaded. I value is the use 197 in the emacs calculation yeah for the homework one so the 197 that i uploaded let me go back and look at that to be sure There they are. Oh, I did. So that should be the... Um, yeah, good catch. That should be the 12 for the carbon. 12. Yeah. Great count. And then I just, the other question on the beta block equation, that Q, is that the charge on the, that's the charge on your particle as well, right? Yes. Okay. So my new um, delta E max is 8.23 times 10 to the fourth EV. Yeah.
Oh, wow. Yeah. So my L becomes, oh, that is up there. Okay. My L becomes 4.64. Okay. Yeah. I'm get yeah, I have a I get like 4.7, but that might just be like rounding because natural logs are weird. Yeah, I tried to carry over everything in the calculator, so that could be what the difference is. So I get overall a little bit higher than twice as much, get 145 MeV per centimeter now. Okay. Is that close to what you got? No. No. Um, okay, I'm looking now. So I still get, um, I, have I, I have the same I value. Yeah. Um, that initial point three zero seven one is the same. Um, I'm looking now to see, um, I think maybe my error might be in the, the first coefficient that ZQ squared over AB squared. So I'm double checking that now. So that would be. And the Q is one because that carbon had a one plus charge. Right. Okay. Q is one. Yeah, 79 times one squared divided by, okay. Okay, now I have that answer. Or very, yeah, I'm getting the same um, MEV now with the beta block equation. Okay. So that's but I also have the, yeah, one, for, yeah. Okay. But then I also, so I have it set up to calculate with the other equation. And then I use, like, I set that one up based on the solution that we did in class. Yeah. And that one gives an answer of 5,243 MEV. Um, so I'm not sure if the input there, I guess because what I did is so I, I have it, the equation set up and then I plugged in all the values from the example in class to get right. the same answer we got in class. So. So the ones that change really, um, You would use the new atomic number for the carbon, right? So that the Z would be six. Right. The, this is still going to be the MC squared for the electron, where you would want to use the um, mass of the electron in grams. So that stays the same as what we had in class. C stays the same as what we had in class. Your beta is going to change now for that carbon though, right? Although that should be the same as the one you already calculated. So that should still be 0 0.2755. Right. Okay. The N is going to change a little bit because you're looking at gold now. So you'd have the 79 electrons per atom. You would need to look up the density of gold. Although that was also in the other equation in the beta block. So that's still going yeah. to be too. 
the 197, which you could use with more decimals if you wanted. This MC squared, I would say is the 511,000 EV. Yeah. Beta would still be beta. The I equation would change and I didn't, don't have right. it here. This one would be appropriate to use. Yeah, I, I use that one and I got that same value, that 166.998. This would be for aluminum though, right? Right. So you, so you want to recalculate this ionization potential, this mean uh, excitation. Yeah, potential. so I use that same formula for the gold. Okay, we're 79 here instead of 13. Right. Okay, okay. And then the 79 in the front as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. to adjust for the nucleons, yeah. So then, that sounds like it's appropriate. The final thing here is um, to use the conversion for the energy. Yeah, so I have the, um, I, get, I, I do get that value, that 1262 two value. Or Just like from class, right? For yeah, from class. So I have it, I have the X, I have like two columns. I have the, the, like, the big division, and the beta block equation. Okay. And so on the left side, I have the, um, the big equation and everything formatted. So when you put in the Z for the particle, the density, the molar mass, atomic number, kinetic energy, um, all those things, it gives you, you get back that value, the 1262. And then on the second column, I have it, I have it copied exactly from um, fixed through the homework problem. And then I just went in and then changed the values. Um, so the only, um, and then I have it based on some of the input from the first column. So like that beta value doesn't change. Right. So maybe at the end of class, we can look at that and, and okay. try to figure it out. Yeah, I can definitely. Um, My advice would be, you know, the second equation, the beta block one, it's a little bit it's easier to simple. apply, a little more straightforward. Um, right. I would just stick with that equation. I don't think people usually like to use the first one. So, um, but we'll try to figure that out so that we can figure out what might be off in terms of, it's probably something with units or it oh, could be okay. Excel references in Excel, so. Okay, I have them, I have them agreeing now for the example from class. Okay. So let me, I'm gonna rename this tab because Making, making sure that it's labeled as the one that works. Oh, of course, I never stopped recording. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to try and copy it and then see if I can get the same, to get out the same values for the homework problem. Um, and then I guess we're a little bit, we ran over, but thank you for your help. And then I will talk to you after. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So um, we started Tuesday talking about interaction of radiation with matter. And we started off by saying that that was because radiation had to interact within matter. It has to somehow deposit its energy if we wanna have any hope of detecting it or knowing when that radiation came through some space. And um, Compton scattering, of course, is one of the ways that that can happen. And uh, Dr. Bryan did chime in and say that, yeah, it's about um, equal probability for all of the scattering angles, but as energy goes up, there is a small shift towards low angle scattering being slightly more probable. Um, so for your, that's your answer there. They're approximately equal, but at higher energies, there is a preference for smaller angles for the scattering. So no matter what kind of particle it is that interacts within matter, if our goal is to detect it, it has to interact. So I know we just talked about all this, but just as kind of a review, when we think about how radiation interacts, we can think about, say, charged particles, heavy charged particles like alphas, 
will create more ion pairs per distance than light charged particles like betas would. So this is gonna impact how we're able to detect these events. Gamma rays can come in and can scatter. They can deposit all their energy through photoelectric effect. They can deposit energy through pair production. And you wanna track all of those particles when these interactions occur to be able to figure out how much energy is going to be deposited within the detector. So that's gonna come into play when we look at spectra and we are trying to interpret spectra. So no matter how the interaction react, how, no matter how the radiation interacts within the detector, within the matter, there are some key requirements. The first one is that the radiation has to interact with the matter within the detector. If the, inter, if the radiation passes through the detector, you're not going to detect it, okay? We do like online detectors. And if you are gonna use an online detector, a detector that tells you exactly when something was detected as it was detected, that those types of detectors generally require, on, require uh, or depend on creation of charge. And then that charge that's created gets collected. Some detection, so we can do this for like total dose. So dosimeters can sometimes be analyzed offline after the exposure. So if you were working in the laboratories, the physical laboratories this summer, you would have been issued dosimeters to track your radiation exposure within the laboratory. Those in a um, employment setting, a work setting, typically get collected once a month. Sometimes they get collected quarterly. And the total amount of radiation they've been exposed to has somehow changed that material. And the amount of that change can be read um, through other techniques that we'll, we'll get to and we'll talk about that. But for those changes to occur, even in those offline detectors for total dose, there still had to be interactions for that radiation with that matter. Hopefully the amount of charge collected or the amount of change in the material is proportional to the energy. And if it's proportional to the energy, then you can use that detector for spectroscopy determining the energy of the radiation. Or if the charge collected or the change in the material is proportional to the number of events entering the detector, then we can use that detector just to count how many particles of radiation came in, okay? These two sometimes, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but there are many detectors that are great for counting but you can't use them for spectroscopy. Um, if the effective ionization energy of air is 35 electron volts, how many total ion pairs would be created from a two MeV alpha? So 35 electron volts per ion pair. How many total ion pairs would be created by a two MeV alpha? 67,000. Yep, so 2 million divided by 35, right? And then you could convert that into coulombs of charge. Now you could actually use the 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And how many coulombs of charge is that gonna be? Is that a big amount of coulombs? Is that a small amount of coulombs? It looks small, but it from I remember reading something like 10 to the minus 14 coulombs was really easy to measure. Right. So is that going to be easy to measure or? I'm going to say yes. Okay. What was the what's the exponent when you do that conversion though? Is it 10 to the 14th? It's the... negative uh, 15th. So it's a little bit smaller. So it is still measurable, but it is a little bit trickier. And we'll talk about that when we talk about some specific detectors, okay? So ideally there would be ways that we could um, increase that number or um, collect it more quickly. And that would, and in some cases we would need to be able to reduce our background, okay? 
So with all these key requirements, this means that we can have a wide range of choices. We can use any kind of detector for a situation, but some detectors are gonna be better than others. And so we're gonna have some different types of detectors that we'll discuss. We won't get through all of this today. We'll, we'll be finishing this up tomorrow, okay? So there are a couple of different types of detectors. There are gas-filled detectors. There are scintillators that require or depend on the creation of light and that light can then be collected and um, either counted or uh, connected back to the energy of the radiation for spectroscopy. There are semiconductor detectors, and there are also radiochromic materials, materials that change their color based on how much radiation they've been exposed to. Besides talking about the types of detectors, we'll spend a little bit of time going over the electronics for the detectors. Not a lot, because I believe you do a lot more with that in the laboratory, especially for pulse height analysis, which I think you're getting into probably next week, if not, the, if not near the end of this week. Um, we'll talk about choosing a detector, depending on what kind of material you're trying to measure or what kind of radiation you're looking for. How do you know what detector is the best one to use? And there might be many options for detectors that you could use. Um, but there typically is a best choice and some that are good but not best. And then we'll also be talking about how we interpret some spectra. And that'll be probably the strongest connection between the lecture and the lab. As we look at all the different types of detectors, we're going to evaluate these detectors based on four parameters. Their sensitivity, their resolution, their timing, and their efficiency. So sensitivity is what types of radiation can be detected. Some materials are sensitive to gamma radiation or more sensitive to gamma radiation than other materials. Some materials may only interact with beta particles, okay? Especially depending on how your detector is set up. Resolution, how well can you dis differentiate or how well can you tell apart two similar energies? So what's the furthest apart two energies have to be for you to be able to tell them apart in a spectra if you're trying to do spectroscopy. Timing, how quickly can the detector respond? Some detectors take a little while to recover after measuring radiation. And efficiency, detections versus decays. Just because you detected it doesn't mean that you're detecting everything that came from all of the decays. So efficiency plays a role in choosing detectors as well, okay? So gas-filled detectors, this may look familiar. I think you guys said you already did some stuff with Geiger counters as the labs, right? Oh yeah. And so Geiger counters are one particular region on this graph. Um, when you have a gas-filled detector, you have a wire in the center and you have the shell of the detector and you create an electric field to accelerate the particles and try to collect all that charge when it's formed. If you don't have any sort of a potential on your detector and your charged particle comes in and interacts within the gas and creates all these ion pairs, all those ion pairs are just gonna recombine, okay? So even when you start to apply a voltage to the detector, you might still be in this recombination region. This is the lowest voltage on this graph and it's labeled down there with recombination, okay? And the y-axis on this graph is pulse height. Do you have to have an alpha particle or a beta particle entering the detector for you to be able to create ion pairs and detect that radiation? How could you detect a gamma ray using a Geiger counter or a gas-filled detector, I should say? What could the gamma ray do within the gas, even though its probability is low? Yeah, Nick. It, it could scatter an electron. Could scatter an electron. It could undergo the photoelectric effect and scatter an electron in air quotes because you're kicking one out from an atom. And those scattered electrons would act just like a beta particle. Okay, if they get created within the detector, then those are the particles that are going to create ion pairs as they lose their energy. 
So it doesn't matter what is coming in, as long as you can create some sort of a charged particle in the detector itself, you can detect the radiation, okay? So these ion pairs get collected. When you get to the top of that recombination region, this is the next region called saturation. You're collecting as much of the charge as you can collect. There will always be a few probably that will still recombine, but you're basically collecting all of the charge that was created directly by the radiation, okay? Then this curve rises when you get past this V1 and you go into this proportional region. Within the proportional region, what's happening is the electric field within the detector is accelerating some of those ion pairs by enough acceleration, enough energy, that some of those ion pairs, some of those electrons that have been created, start to move fast enough where they now cause the formation of other ion pairs. So you have a multiplication effect within this proportional region. Is that secondary ionization? And it's secondary ionization. Okay. okay. And depending on your voltage in this region, this proportionality constant, this multiplication effect, that constant, that factor changes depending on your applied voltage. The more applied voltage, the more secondary ionization you get, okay? The proportional region is nice because you get so many more ion pairs from alpha particles than you do from beta particles within the region of the detector. So as long as that alpha particle can get in, you can tell the difference here because of um, the amount of the charge that's created. When you go higher into voltages, you get into this region of limited proportionality where there's not necessarily a nice uh, ratio between the amount of charge collected and the amount of charge produced. And then, so we don't use that region a lot for detectors. And then you get into the Geiger region. Notice that the alpha particle pulse height and the beta particle pulse height meet in the Geiger region. And you get a single pulse height for a, a single voltage, no matter whether it was an alpha particle or a beta particle. Okay. In the Geiger region, there's some other stuff going on and we'll discuss that a little bit more on a later slide. This was meant to be kind of an overview, but here's the details. So, um, it's pretty much what I already said. The one thing I wanna point out is that when you're in the saturation region, the type of detector you can use in that region for a gas filled detector is called an ionization chamber. Because you're collecting only the amount of charge that was created directly by the radiation, you have very, very tiny currents. This means that you need to have uh, sensitive electronics to collect the current. But the nice thing about this saturation region is that it's relatively flat. So even if your applied voltage is fluctuating a little bit, you're still gonna be collecting a constant amount of charge based off of the radiation that came in. By collecting charge, are you saying the detector measuring the count rate, or is that something else? The detector, when a single radiation, when a single particle enters the detector, it's going to create ion pairs, it's going to create charge, deposit its energy in the form of charge, and all those electrons and all those ion pairs move towards the appropriate electrodes in the detector when there's applied voltage. And that all gets collected kind of all at once. And you can um, integrate that using like capacitors and stuff and special kinds of circuit things. That's a, a little bit more on the electronics part. Um, and because you can use RC circuits or a AC capacitor kind of thing, you are able to basic, even if it comes in over a couple nanoseconds, you are able to sum up all of that charge and measure that as a single current, okay? Um, the more energy that was with the radiation particle, the more ion pairs you would create and the more current, the more charge you would collect. 
So ionization chambers can actually be used to determine the energy of the radiation particles. Proportional counters, we kind of already covered that. You can discriminate between alpha and beta particles coming in. You get larger currents, which means that your electronics can be a little less expensive. You can use standard amplifiers with proportional counters, but because that proportionality changes based off of the voltage, you do have to spend more money on power supplies. You have to be able to supply a very precise, very stable voltage to your detector. When you increase the voltage even more past that proportional region and you get into the Geiger region, that then is when your secondary ionizations get so significant that you have these towns and avalanches or cascades. You can sometimes have so much energy deposited when an electron causes an ionization that you can also create these ultraviolet photons. Those ultraviolet photons travel within the gas and can themselves initiate other cascades, other avalanches. So in the Geiger region, Typically what happens is the whole gas inside gets ionized and all that charge has to get collected before we can measure something again. So in the Geiger region, this is nice for a detector because the pulse height or the collected current is independent of the initial energy. So you can use Geiger counters to count radiation, to determine the activity of a source as long as it's sensitive to the radiation. The events forming a single ion pair versus thousands of ion pairs are indistinguishable. Every single radiation event that comes in, every anytime anything deposits any energy in the Geiger counter, that's gonna get counted. Um, there are dead regions in the proportional region when you're doing counting but with the Geiger counter, the whole tube itself is a dead region until the gas recombines and all those ion pairs get collected and all the charge gets canceled out. Within the gas, the electrons actually move faster than the holes or the electrons move faster than the positive ions. The electrons only take about 500 nanoseconds to get collected at the electrode versus the cations taking about 100 to 500 microseconds to be collected. So that time for all that charge to get collected, how long it takes it to get collected is known as dead time. That detector, that Geiger counter, cannot pick up on any more radiation during that dead time. Stuff might come in, but and it might create a little bit more charge, but the detector is not going to be able to tell the difference between that second event and the first event. So to help this out, sometimes we apply or we incorporate a quench gas which helps one, reduce the number of the ultraviolet photons coming from these electron cascades, but it also helps things to recombine a little bit faster so that the dead time is reduced. In proportional counters compared to Geiger counters, you generally replenish the gas continuously. You have a gas flow through the proportional counter so that you do not have to use a quench gas and you do not have to worry about your quench gas degrading over time. So a typical quench gas, a typical Geiger counter only works for about 1 million counts, or is only reliable, let's say, for about 1 million counts, 1 million radiation events being detected. So when we think about gas-filled detectors, they've got advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages of gas-filled detectors is that they're pretty inexpensive, especially for Geiger counters. You can discriminate between alpha and beta radiation if you have a proportional counter. Geiger counters and ionization chambers are pretty portable, so you can take them with you, not proportional counters so much. And gas-filled detectors are great just for counting detected radiation. So if you just want to know if there is radiation somewhere and how much is there and not necessarily what type or what energy, then gas-filled detectors are great for this. Even ionization chambers could still be used sometimes for determining energy, but a lot of times they're used more just to determine the total amount of um, dose in a particular region, in a laboratory, let's say. Disadvantages of gas-filled detectors are that 
uh, you have to have expensive power supplies for the proportional counters. The quench gas degrades over the lifetime of the detector. The gas filled detectors have dead time. Many of them are, they are known pretty much as being paralyzable detectors. So if you paralyze something, what does that mean? You can't like, measure any more counts within that time frame. Right. And the detector, that time frame can grow. So if you have too many events coming in, too many radiation particles coming in, you can actually paralyze the detector so it doesn't count anything anymore in that radiation field. You'd have to remove it from the radiation field for it to be able to get be reset. So um, this can be an issue when you go into areas with higher radiation amounts because your detector might undercount the amount of radiation in that space. Uh, Gas-filled detectors generally have poor resolution for energy, except for ionization chambers, and the low density of the gas itself is poor for detecting gamma rays. So gas-filled detectors would be okay for alpha, beta, maybe even neutrons, depending on what kind of gas you filled it with, but we typically use them for detecting alphas and betas. To help you see dead time and what I mean by paralyzable versus something like non-paralyzable, there is an event here, radiation that enters the detector at that highlighted peak. The detector responds and cannot respond to any other radiation for that highlighted time. If you have two events, occurring together close in time. The first one causes the detector to respond. The second one also causes the detector to respond, but not independently. It's still responding to that first event. All it does is it makes that response time longer. That still gets counted as one single event, okay? If your events are occurring too quickly, it's possible that you can completely paralyze your detector and you will not count all of the radiation or even close to all of the radi radiation that's in that space. Whereas a non-paralyzable detector, it's still dead for some period of time after a radiation event, but it does not respond to any other events while it's dead. So it has a fixed length of a dead time. So these three events here in the middle that happened pretty close together in time with a paralyzable detector were only counted as one event. With a non-paralyzable detector, we count the event that occurred after the first event's dead time. So we're still able to detect a good portion of the radiation events, even though we're not detecting all of them. This is important for being able to correct how much activity or how many counts you're seeing from a source. Did you do, did you see any data from a split source with the Geiger Counter Lab? Yep. So you already did a dead time calculation. So for our paralyzable detectors like GM counters, the measured count rate M equals the true or natural count rate N times E to the negative N tau, and that tau is the dead time. If your true count rate, if your true decay rate goes up, that N in that exponential, in that E term, a very large N is going to make that E term go to zero. So for high enough true count rates, it's possible that your measured count rate could also approach zero. Whereas for a non-paralyzable detector, the measured count rate equals the true count rate over one plus N times the dead time you're going to miss some radiation particles entering the detector, but this is not ever going to go to zero. Instead, it's going to approach a limit. 
And that limit is going to depend on the dead time. You have any questions so far about gas filled detectors, dead time? Okay. So then, scintillation detectors. These rely on the creation of light to detect the radiation event. One of the original method, methods is actually was used in Rutherford's experiment with the gold foil. Everybody remembers Rutherford discovering the nucleus, right? And his foil or his screen around the gold foil was coated with zinc sulfide. And that can be doped with silver if you're trying to do something with like photographs or whatever. You could also use organic crystals as scintillators, anthracene still being terphenyl, but they're brittle and it's hard to grow large single crystals. So if your crystals are small, then you don't have a lot of mat matter that the radiation can interact with. If you can create things that will scintillate in the presence of radiation that will create the light, that's great, but how would you go about detecting the light? There are these things called photomultiplier tubes. And in a photomultiplier tube, the light interacts on the end of the photomultiplier tube with a photocathode. The light interacts with the photocathode through the photoelectric effect and ejects an electron or multiple electrons, depending on the energy of the light. Those ejected electrons get accelerated towards these dynodes which are technically anodes, they are positively charged. The dynodes are stepped down at varying voltages through the photomultiplier tube. Each time the electron is accelerated towards a dynode, it gets accelerated towards that dynode, strikes the dynode and causes more electrons to be ejected. So you have a multiplication effect throughout these stages. Each of those multiplied electrons then get accelerated to the next dynode and they kind of like bounce through these dynodes multiplying as they go. And then at the end, the final anode collects all of the charge and this results in a pulse. This is really great because you can take all of those electrons, any of those electrons that were created at the photocathode and you can multiply them. So you are collecting here very, very large amounts of charge. The electrons created at the end, the number of electrons created at the end, are always going to be proportional to the energy of the photons or the number of photons that struck the photocathode. So scintillation detectors can be proportional to the amount of energy deposited in the detector itself. The photomultiplier tube is part of the detector, but that's not where the true radiation is interacting. The photon that interacts with this photomultiplier tube is not our gamma ray, okay? It's a photon created by something that, by some other material that the gamma ray interacted with. So we have solid scintillators, we have liquid scintillators. Liquid scintillators, the liquid should be transparent to visible light. We want the light to be able to move through the liquid. We want it to be able to get to the photocathode. We don't want it to be reabsorbed within the liquid itself, okay? Um, so we also want efficient energy transfer between the scintillating solute, the molecule that creates the light, and the liquid itself so that the molecule that um, is scintillating can re-relax um, after emitting that, that light, depending on its vibrational energy states and such. The scintillants themselves should produce light that's not reabsorbed by other scintillants, which would be quenching. Um, so remember, if you emit a photon and something else can absorb it at that same energy, that's a bad thing. So there are um, wavelength sh shifters that can help with this. Um, wavelength shifters are also used to help increase the wavelength, i.e. decrease the frequency um, so that the photons interact more efficiently at the photocathode. 
We have all the different kinds of molecules that connect as scintillants or as wavelength shifters. The molecule structures are shown on this slide. What do you notice about those molecules? What do they all have in common? They're all conjugated or have like aromatic. Aromatic and conjugated. Very aromatic, a lot of extended pi bonds. Um, what does that do for light? Anybody know? For electron absorbance? Would that increase your lambda max? That can inc that absolutely increases your lambda max. So the longer the conjugated network is, the higher the wavelength of maximum absorbance, if you're absorbing light, okay? But what we're trying to do with these also is we're trying to emit light. So that could be good. That's gonna happen for the wavelength shifters for sure. What else does this mean in terms of electronic transitions? When it you have- it, it makes the gap closer. From right. the homo to the lumen. Right, your homo lumo gap, your pi pi star, if it's a pi pi star transition that occurs. So remember, that just takes energy to cause that excitation. Where could that energy be coming from in, the, in, uh, in terms of detecting radiation? Say it again, Megan. It could be coming from the gamma ray, an alpha particle, a beta particle. It can come from the secondary ions created from the ion pairs that you create when those charged particles move through the liquid. So anything at all that can transfer energy, okay? And that's really this liquid uh, match with the energy, efficient energy transfer. Your radiation is most likely to interact with your solvent, not with your solute. But when energy interacts with your solvent, if you can transfer that energy to the solute, then you can excite these pi electrons and you can, um, then they, when they de-excite, that's how you get the light, okay? So the end goal is that we transfer energy to these scintillators or that a wavelength shifter like the molecule at the bottom, I think that is the, um, that's the para bis ortho methyl styryl benzene. That's the bottom molecule there. Um, when they absorb light and re-emit re light, then that's the, the wavelength shift. So these two processes are related, okay? What do we call the process where an electron gets excited and then it emits light? Fluorescence? Uh, yeah, especially if the electron is excited by what? UV light. A photon. Light, a photon. So if you have a photon in and the electron gets excited and the electron de-excites and another photon out, that's called fluorescence as long as that in-out process happens when? Pretty instantaneously pretty instantaneously, a very short time scale between them. If you have absorption and then you have emission, but the emission happens much later, instead of calling that fluorescence, what do we typically call that? Phosphorescence. Phosphorescence. So this is like low in the dark stuff, okay? Both are going to be factors when we look at things that scintillate. And just to kind of go over this a little bit, this is kind of a p-chemy sort of slide. Um, talking about like singlets and triplets and stuff, although I don't have triplets on here, but that would be for phosphorescence. You've got your molecule in the ground state. Those are these S0 states. You could have many different vibrational states there. Those are those smaller lines right above the S00, okay? Any electron in any one of those states could absorb energy and move up into a higher energy singlet state, the first electronic excited state would be the S1. For most of these scintillating molecules, that's typically three to four electron volts in terms of their energy difference, okay? The singlet first electronic excited state also has multiple vibrational states. So the electron could go into any of those. They can move between those vibrational states through non-radiative transitions. But when they get to the, oh, is that what you guys are talking about right now? Jablonski diagrams, yeah, great stuff. Um, 
when you get to the lowest vibrational energy state of that first electronic excited state, then that's when that electron can undergo decay through fluorescence or radiative um, transit, ra a radiative transition, okay? Um, the lifetime here, tau, that's just going back to like lifetime and half-life. It's the same formula you guys talked about with Cody. Um, we typically talk about lifetimes for these states rather than half-lives for these states. And you should notice it's basically the same equation. It's the same math, the same numbers, okay? And the key here really is that pi electrons do these transitions very well, especially for radiative transitions. And if we look real quick at the energy of absorption and compare that to the energy of fluorescence, what do you notice on this diagram in terms of the energy that's absorbed compared to the energy that's emitted? There's a positive gap. Well, actually, there's a gap on both. There's a gap on S0 and S1. So the absorbent, absorption energy, how does that compare to the fluorescence energy? It's more. Yeah, there's more energy absorbed than there is emitted. So there's less energy absorbed than there, there's less energy emitted than there was absorbed. So what does that do for your wavelength of light that's emitted versus the wavelength of light that excited. The wavelength coming out is going to be longer. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that's what we mean by like wavelength matching and by the liquid being transparent to our visible light and why sometimes wavelength shifters are used. So it's no good here if you have a fluorescence, if you have a light emission, that perfectly matches the energy transition of another molecule in the solution that makes it more likely to get absorbed. So when you have fluorescence, but that fluorescence gets reabsorbed and maybe that energy dissipates in other ways, that's what we call quenching, okay? And that's always gonna reduce the amount of fluorescence. Um, you might talk about like photon yield or luminescence yield for different fluorescent materials, okay? The key with all of this is that we're using these electronic states of these molecules to collect all of the energy that's deposited in the liquid solution and turn all that into light. So whenever an alpha particle or a beta particle gets emitted, it's gonna create energy in the solution, it's gonna deposit energy in the solution. That energy causes the liquid to get excited the liquid transfers its excitation energy to our scintillating molecules. Our scintillating molecules get excited and then fluoresce. That fluorescent light from the scintillating molecules could be reabsorbed by a wavelength shifter, which will use the uh, phenomenon of the Stokes shift to make that wavelength longer so that the wavelength now of that second fluorescence event doesn't really match a lot of other stuff in the solution. And the light from that second wavelength shifter fluorescence event can be picked up by our photomultiplier tubes, okay? And those photomultiplier tubes then turn that light into a charge which gets collected and the amount of collected energy, the amount of collected charge or current is proportional to the energy of the alpha or the beta particle. So you can use liquid scintillation counting to do spectroscopy. You can, it's possible, okay? It's got really bad resolution, so it would not be my first choice for spectroscopy, but you could do spectroscopy with liquid scintillation counting. What is a cocktail? The cocktail is that whole solution. The solvent, the fluorescent molecule, the solute that you chose to um, collect the charge initially, the energy initially and turn it into light, the wavelength shifter, and um, I didn't mention surfactants. Everybody knows what surfactants are, right? They help lipids and oils dissolve in water. 
Sometimes people call them detergents. So they are gonna help materials mix. So if you're looking at our solvents here for our liquid scintillation cocktail, you're thinking about toluene or xylene, does that sound like it's gonna be great for dissolving aqueous samples? Not so much. That's where the surfactants come into play, okay? So you've got basically detergent molecules there that will help the water um, spread out homogeneously throughout the liquid scintillation cocktail, okay? That's what we call the whole thing, the combination. So, couple big advantages for liquid scintillation counting. And I've got the one diagram at the top of the slide. So the circle where you see the light coming out of that, that circle is supposed to be our sample vial. And that sample vial is going to contain your scintillation cocktail and a aliquot of whatever you're trying to measure the radiation of. Of course, this means your radiation, your material has to be in solution first, okay? but that's fine. A lot of the stuff we work with, especially in the lab when we're doing radiochemistry, is already in an aqueous solution. The other advantage here, or the main advantage, is that the sample gets dissolved directly in the detector. So you're not going to have any energy loss for your particles going from where they decay to the detector. The other thing is if your sample is in the middle of that vial and it decays, what did you see for the ranges? I know these were half value layers, but what did you see for the ranges for things like carbon-14 and tritium? You're doing this, if you're doing liquid scintillation for beta counting or beta spectroscopy, did the tritium beta particle or the carbon-14 beta particle go very far in aluminum. I know this is not a solution, but they don't go very far at all, right? We're talking on the order of like, you know, one to 20 micrometers in aluminum. This might go up, a, this would definitely go up a little bit when we're talking about a solution instead of a solid but something dissolve, something decaying in the middle of our sample vial, that radiation particle is definitely going to interact with the cocktail well before it gets to the outside of the vial. It goes away. Agreed? So that means basically if it's in the vial and it decays, it's going to create light and get detected. Because you can Put that sample vial into a chamber that can be mirrored so that any light that comes out of that sample vial reflects off the walls and back towards the photomultiplier tubes. You can collect all of that light that gets created within the sample, and so, or almost all. And so this is called a four pi detector. You can fine tune, you can tweak your cocktail, your scintillation cocktail for specific loading requirements. Are you analyzing um, samples that came from a specific kind of ion exchange? Are you analyzing samples of ocean water? Are you analyzing um, runoff in rivers from mines? Like you can tailor your scintillation cocktail for your specific analytical situation? Does it need to be able to handle certain complexants like EDTA or DTPA, ethylene, diamine, tetraacetic acid? Does it need to handle high concentration of salts? Some of these kinds of things like salt concentration, acid concentration, can affect the liquid scintillation cocktail and can cause quenching, which would reduce our efficiency for counting okay, or detection. And so you would choose specific scintillation cocktails based off of your application. Because we're talking about small molecules, because we're ta not talking about solids, um, because we're talking about like these pi pi star electron transitions and we're talking about fluorescence, liquid scintillation has short light decay lifetimes. So on the order of two to three nanoseconds. 
if we think of that as representing our dead time, then that's really good. That's much shorter than the dead time for Geiger counters, okay? The number of photons emitted by the scintillation cocktail is always going to be proportional to the amount of energy deposited by the radiation. And as shown in that picture above, if you use two Geiger counters, because light from that sample is not always gonna come out in the same direction, but a single event is gonna cause light to be emitted at almost the same time. If you can collect that light on two sides, then that's called coincidence counting. And it's not that you're trying to track down where the radiation came from. What you're trying to do is you're trying to prove that when you see an event from your photomultiplier tube, that because there was an event in the other photomultiplier tube, that event, you have a greater confidence that it actually came from your sample. So what you're doing when you do coincidence counting is you're doing that to cut down on electronic noise, okay? So our photons from our sample are not the only things that could be interacting with our photomultiplier tubes. We've got all this cosmic radiation and stuff, right? And so if a gamma ray or an X-ray or something from naturally occurring radioactive material or from cosmic rays interacts with one of those photomultiplier tubes, and we get a signal from that, but not a matching signal from the other photomultiplier tube, then we can rule that out as background noise, and we don't count that. Okay. So liquid scintillation counting has a lot of advantages, but for something that sounds so great, it's probably also going to have a lot of disadvantages, and that's that the liquid scintillation cocktails, many of them are hazardous materials on their own, even before you put radiation into them. And when you have hazardous materials that are themselves radioactive, you have a lot of stuff you got to do to try and um, dispose of those materials. They have worked on making greener cocktails, but the greener cocktails are not necessarily as efficient as the more historically used liquid scintillation cocktails. Uh, nitrates and oxygen especially cause chemical quenching, which is gonna cut down on the efficiency of your detection. So if you've got all your samples in nitric acid, as is commonly the case when you're working on doing fuel re nuclear fuel reprocessing, then um, you might not have great efficiency or results coming from liquid scintillation counting. They do, you only get about 10 to 50% of the light output from the energy um, in liquid scintillation compared to solid scintillators. So solid scintillators in many cases are still preferred. Um, but this is many times outweighed by the advantage that your sample goes directly into your detector. Whereas with a solid scintillator, your sample has to sit somewhere outside of the detector. And the final disadvantage here, of course, is that when we're talking about liquids, we're generally talking about hydrocarbons. So they have a low average Z, which means that they are poor materials for trying to do anything with gamma rays. Okay. Do you guys have questions on scintillation? Okay. What I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna point out that there are a couple of exercises. Some of the parts on this second exercise, you will not be able to answer right now at this moment, okay? Um, they're going to depend on some of the other detectors that we're about to get into. We're not gonna finish detectors today, don't worry about that. Um, so we may not even get to all of them today, but I did wanna have this up here. Um, and the other question there is doing some calculations with the dead time and choosing a detector for a specific situation. I wanna give you guys a, a quick break. Let's come back around 1.30 and we'll work through a few more slides today. Um, and I can take any other questions that you guys happen to have right now. I am gonna pause the recording now that I remembered that. All right, so um, to compare and contrast solid scintillators with liquid scintillators, our liquid scintillators were relying on small molecules dissolved in solution, and solid scintillators are going to be a big crystal, typically. 
the sodium iodide doped with thallium is going to be the most common solid scintillator we're going to see. Um, there are many other kinds, though. The thallium concentration within the sodium iodide, it's doped up to a concentration that would basically be equivalent to one millimolar. I was curious what that was when I was trying to figure out. I was always like, how much thallium is in there? What does it mean when it's doped? Um, it does rely on slightly different mechanisms than in molecular fluorescence. It's still the same kind of general idea that you're gonna have electrons that get excited, and those electrons are going to de-excite, and when they de-excite, they're going to, going to emit light. But in molecular fluorescence, we're looking at a single molecule, and so we have these Jablonski diagrams, and we talk about singlet states or triplet states if you like to get into phosphorescence. But with solids, we talk instead about bands. We talk about valence bands and conduction bands. And we can also talk about how dopants will influence the locations or the energies of these bands. So we're gonna get a little bit into some material science today so we can understand these solid scintillators. And we're gonna spend a good bit of time on it because it's also gonna help us understand how semiconductor detectors work. We're gonna use a lot of these same kinds of terms there with valence and conduction. Um, you might talk about some of these same terms when you see some organic molecules incorporated into polymers to be solid scintillators. And, um, but because those are still separate molecules, you're still gonna be talking about really molecular fluorescence rather than bands. So I should take that back, I guess. Um, one of the big problems with solid scintillators like sodium iodide doped with thallium is they're typically hygroscopic. And so the detectors have to be enclosed in metal cans. Um, so what type of radiation do you think it would be bad to try to use a solid scintillator for? Alpha? Yeah, because the alpha particles aren't going to get into the detector volume. Um, solid scintillators then are typically coupled directly to a photomultiplier tube. So the photocathode of a photomultiplier tube is in direct contact with your solid scintillator, and then they are kind of out together canned with the photomultiplier tube still having outputs on the back to go to the electronics. So what do we mean by bands? Where do these bands come from? So if you think about atomic orbitals, when atomic atoms come together, you can have molecular orbitals. When you have two atoms coming together and you have one orbital from each atom hybridizing or overlapping or coming together to form molecular orbitals, you get two orbitals out. If you had four atoms, each one with one orbital overlapping, then you would have four orbitals out, et cetera, et cetera. The more atoms you've got, sharing orbitals, the more molecular orbitals you have. There comes a point when there's so many molecular orbitals, they're so close together in energy that it doesn't really make sense to talk about them as molecular orbitals anymore, and we talk about them as bands. So that's where my idea for the first meme came from. Much orbital, very band, okay? Um, so solids, solid crystals, solid materials, we're gonna talk about bands, but these are analogous to our molecular orbitals. It's just that there's so many molecular orbitals that we don't, can't really differentiate the individual orbitals anymore. The valence band is gonna be where the valence electrons typically live. In the case of sodium and sodium solid, sodium metal, the number of electrons in that S orbital mean that your valence band for the solid is only partially filled, okay? So the number of electrons that can fit into that valence band and the number of electrons that you have, you have fewer electrons than there are spots for the electrons. So the valence band is only partially filled. If you go to something like zinc and you look at those same S orbitals, well, different shell, but S orbitals in zinc, and you look at the valence band then for zinc, Zinc's valence band is filled because all of those electrons match the same number of positions for them in the valence band. 
This can create inter interesting situations when you have, say, p orbitals that are close in energy that are overlapping and forming a band. This band where a lot of the orbitals were empty, this is where electrons can freely flow. So this is called the conduction band. And for something like zinc, zinc happens to have the conduction band, which is empty, overlapping with the valence band, which is filled. Because there's an overlap there, it basically takes no energy for you to move an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. If it takes a very small amount of energy to make that transition, then what do you think zinc is really good at doing? Conducting. Conducting electrons, conducting electricity, okay? It's not our first choice for wiring or anything like that but it's certainly going to be a better electrical conductor than something like the sodium based off of the band structure, okay? The final comment to make here, and it's shown on the sodium side with the dashed line, okay? And it would still be shown on the zinc side kind of exactly halfway between the conduction band and the valence band is the idea of the Fermi level. And the Fermi level for band structure is the energy level, it's a hypothetical energy level, where it has a 50% chance of being occupied by an electron, okay? This is gonna be key because we're gonna look at where this Fermi level goes as we do different things to our solids. So sodium and zinc, these are both metals. This is an example of band structure in metals kind of expanding this now and not just talking about metals, but talking about any kind of material. Again, the valence band is analogous to the highest occupied molecular orbital. This is where the electrons are generally going to live. It's hard for electrons to move in this band, so there's poor conduction there. The conduction band is like the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. This is where free motion of electrons can occur, okay? So this is where electrons are gonna go to be conducted as an electrical current in the case of, say, a semiconductor. The forbidden band is typically going to be your gap between conduction and valence bands. And the forbidden band, literally no electrons can exist there for a pure material, okay? So the figure at the top of this slide where the conduction band and the valence band are separated, the white space in between would be the forbidden band for a pure material. Now, it's very hard to get perfectly pure materials. So many times what happens is you dope the material with some sort of a dopant. That dopant could be an electron-rich dopant, or it could be an electron-poor dopant. If it's an electron-rich dopant, then it basically places electrons within the forbidden band, because it's a dopant now, it's not a pure material anymore places electrons in the forbidden band that are closer to the conduction band. And what that does is that increases the Fermi level. So it brings the Fermi level closer to the conduction band and it makes it a smaller energy gap for your electrons to go from your dopant to the conduction band. If you dope in an electron poor dopant, this could be a, an acceptor instead of a donor this is gonna decrease the Fermi level. You're creating holes in the conduction band that are closer to the valence band. So again, you're decreasing that energy gap between the conduction and the valence bands effectively, okay? These electron-rich donors, electron-poor acceptors, these are generally referenced back to, say, silicon, okay? So silicon has four valence electrons. If you have more than four valence electrons, that's electron rich. If you have less than four valence electrons, that's electron poor, okay? In our band diagrams, there's something called a band gap. For a pure material, this is the energy gap between the valence and the conduction bands. But if you've put a dopant into your material, it's going to be the difference between the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied or it's the gap between your donor levels and the conduction band, or the gap between the valence band and your acceptor levels, okay? 
One key thing to note here is that we don't have these acceptors or donors throughout the whole material. It's not creating a whole new band. It's just like one local spot with a few atoms around where one of those atoms happens to have an extra electron to give away. Or one atom with a few other atoms around where one of those atoms happens to have an electron missing, okay? So instead of picturing like a smooth surface for these bands, especially with the dopants, when you've got dopants there, it's like you've got little dips. And those little dips are where your acceptors are. Or you've got little hills, and those little hills in these electron levels are where your donors are, okay? So this relates to, and I put it up here, even though we're talking about solid scintillators right now, I put it up here because it still relates to semiconductors. What this means is that we have this terminology when we talk about things that dope into our materials, and it comes from semiconductor terminology. So an N-type semiconductor, an N-type semiconductor is going to have an electron-rich dopant. It's going to raise our donor level and bring our donor level up closer to the conduction band. So an N-type dopant is something like phosphorus, for instance. A P-type semiconductor or a P-type dopant is going to have holes, it's going to have missing electrons, it's going to be electron poor, and it's going to create acceptor levels that are closer to the valence band. Okay, so we see typical band gaps here on this slide, I'm giving them to you in kilojoules per mole, because this is how we might think about the solid material. Later on, I'm going to give them to you in electron volts, because that's going to matter for being able to detect radiation. Okay. Um, Pure silicon, a pure semiconductor, an intrinsic semiconductor has that band gap for silicon of 106 kilojoules per mole, okay? And sodium iodide doped with thallium to bring us back to that um, is about 2,510 kilojoules per mole. And still there though, this is a band gap in terms of electron volts. This is a band gap of about 26 electron volts, okay? Uh, you can compare these semiconductors, these doped P-type, intrinsic, or N-type, to other kinds of materials. In the cases of metals, your valence and your conduction bands are perfectly overlapping, so your band gap would be zero, okay? And for an insulator, your valence and conduction bands are very far apart, so your band gap is basically too large for normal energy to overcome, which is why insulators do not conduct electricity you don't have enough energy really normally, typically, to promote those valence electrons into the conduction band, okay? Um, so, kind of to review so far, what type of dopant would you say thallium is within a sodium iodide detector? If it's commonly used, then it's probably the n-type. So how many valence electrons does it have compared to, say, silicon? One less. Like more than four, less than four. Has three. Has three, which means that's less than four. So is that electron rich or electron poor? Electron poor. Electron poor. So that's a p-type dopant. So what are you creating then in the material? Are you creating acceptor levels or are you creating donor levels? Acceptor levels. Acceptor levels, okay. For pure sodium iodide, one of the reasons why you don't use pure sodium iodide even though it could scintillate with um, radiation is because the energy of the gammas coming in or the energy of the photons that you could emit from the scintillating events rather would be perfectly matched to the band gap. So if you've got a gamma ray come in, it interacts, it, it causes energy to be deposited, um, it excites electrons, moves electrons from 
valence into the conduction band. They fall from the conduction band back to the valence band. That energy gap, every time a photon is emitted, it could be reabsorbed by another neighboring electron. And just like with the liquid scintillation, that could affect quenching because you have mechanisms where that energy can be released where that do not result in the emission of a photon. So if it was pure sodium iodide, you'd have poor transmission of scintillation through the crystal. So instead, by doping thallium in, you're creating acceptor sites where the electrons that got excited by your radiation to the conduction band, they can fall from the conduction band back to those acceptor levels, okay? So it makes the band gap smaller, but it's also affecting our light transmission properties. When those excited ele electrons fall down into the acceptor level and then they fall from the acceptor level back to the valence band, now that band gap is smaller, so the wavelength is longer. And it doesn't match as well the electronic properties of the crystal itself, so it's more likely to get transmitted all the way through the crystal to the photomultiplier tube. Okay. Um, so the energy then of the emitted photons or the fluorescent photons does not match the energy gap between the valence and the conduction band. So even though you have a few localized acceptor levels, there's a small enough number of those where the photons that you do emit from this process are less likely to be absorbed by the crystal. Overall, within the crystal, there's about a 230 nanosecond decay time. This incorporates both the electron getting excited into the conduction band, moving somewhere in the conduction band to where it finds a local acceptor level, and the lifetime of that singlet level where that electron then decays back to the valence band and emits that fluorescent photon. We have decent energy resolution we, you typically pick a particular gamma ray energy. And you look at the width of that peak um, compared to the energy that you're detecting. And you will look at the width either in energy compared to the energy, or you look at the width in channel numbers compared to the channel number. Um, and the resolution for sodium iodide doped with thallium up around 1332 keV. I think that's, yeah, I'm not going to try to say which one. I remember that's a cobalt isotope. Can't remember if it's cobalt 57 or cobalt 60. Um, at that energy, the detector has a 6% resolution. Okay, so you, your energy would have to be greater than 6% away from 1332 for you to be able to resolve your peak two peaks. Okay. The absolute detector efficiency, assuming that a gamma ray enters the sodium iodide doped with thallium crystal. 8% is about as high as you can get for your absolute efficiency. So that's the probability, overall probability that any gamma ray entering that crystal is gonna interact and deposit energy, okay? And that 8% is typically done with a three inch by three inch cylinder. So it's a three inch diameter and a three inch height for our crystal cylinder for the sodium iodide doped with thallium. Okay, and uh, one possible problem with using scintillating detectors like this, solid scintillators, is that by default, at least, we don't have a setup for coincidence counting. So they are more susceptible to background radiation. So you would wanna do a little bit more to try and correct for background radiation with a detector like this. Okay, what questions do you guys have right now? Can you re-explain the idea of, um, you were saying something along the lines of, if you use a different crystal, the electrons will be less likely to be absorbed? So, um, with the efficiency, so if you go to a smaller crystal, your efficiency is gonna go down because it's gonna be more likely that the gamma rays can leave can pass straight through the crystal without even interacting 
So this three inch diameter by three inch height crystal volume is the reference standard where we get this 8% efficiency from. If that crystal is smaller, you're reducing the amount of matter, you're making it more likely that a gamma ray might come in and pass straight through the material without interacting at all. Okay. Um, the, which of these do you think the sodium or the iodine, because that's what the crystal is based on, which of these do you think the gamma rays are going to interact with? Probably the iodine because I think those are bigger. And they have a greater Z, a higher Z. Okay. Oh, okay. So remember the higher the Z, the more likely it is that you're gonna experience the photoelectric effect at least, okay? Um, what other questions? So this is where I'm gonna stop for today. Um, when we pick up tomorrow, we will still be talking about a lot of these concepts with the bands. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, some dosimeters that can be used in the laboratory, and then we'll get into talking about semiconductors. And uh, then we'll finish up tomorrow with electronics and spectroscopy interpretation, okay? I'm happy to answer any other questions you guys have, but um, I do want to make sure that I'm one stopping at a good spot and